Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is determining the tilt and orientation of a PV system. Our objective today is to introduce one of the most basic core tasks of solar site analysis, measuring tilt and orientation and determining its effects on the performance of PV systems. We'll learn to use an orienteering compass and an inclinometer and how to read a TUF chart for your location to determine tilt and orientation factor. Tilt and orientation factor, henceforth referred by its initials as TOF, is one of the most important efficiency hoops through which radiant energy must jump before a PV system ultimately delivers grid compliant AC to your electrical utility or charges the batteries for your off-grid application. If you wish to capture radiant energy and convert it into useful electrical energy, at its most fundamental level, you need to put your collector in a sunny place, maximize collector surface area, minimize obstructions between the sun and the collector, at the bare minimum, point the collector at the sun. The best PV panel on Earth won't harvest abundant energy if it's poorly sighted. Conceptually, we can think of a PV system as a cascaded efficiency arrangement, where the entire system is visualized as a series string of subsystems, where each subsystem hands off their output to the next subsystem's input. Each subsystem's efficiency rating only allows it to hand off less than 100% of its input. It's helpful to visualize each subsystem as progressively smaller doors through which a percentage loss is shaved off every time an input passes from one subsystem to the next. Math aside, if the very first subsystem is handing off only a pittance of incoming energy to the second one, it's just going to get worse and worse further down the line. A cascaded efficiency arrangement, therefore, can only be as efficient as its most inefficient system. This is analogous to the adage that a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Mathematically, one can simply multiply individual subsystem efficiency ratings together to arrive at the complete system's efficiency rating. Consider a four-stage system with the following efficiency ratings. If 100 joules enters the first stage, only 90 joules of energy make it to the second stage, which means 67.5 joules make it to the third stage, and 40.5 joules make it to the fourth stage, meaning 38.5 joules come out. If we consider the system as a whole, 100 joules went in and 38.5 joules came out. Therefore, our system is 38.5% efficient. If we wanted to arrive at this number directly without performing intermediate analysis, again, we'd multiply the efficiency rating for each stage, thereby directly solving for the efficiency for the entire system. Consider another system with 100 subsystems, where each subsystem is 99% efficient. This is an effect equivalent to multiplying 0.99 by itself 100 times or 0.99 to the 100th power. Therefore, our total system efficiency is only 36.6% efficient. The bold lettering on the outside of the package proclaiming each subsystem is 99% efficient is true. However, when you've got that many subsystems shaving off 1% each time it passes through them, your output suffers cumulative losses and simply dies in an accumulation of 100 tiny cuts. Consider a final example of a four-stage system where one of the stages is a remarkably poor performer in comparison to the others. It doesn't matter in which order the system is arranged because at some point all input has to flow through this one inefficient stage. It could be up front, in the middle, or at the end, but regardless, at one point or another, the whole system suffers because of this one inefficient stage. It just can't deliver any more energy than this one stage is capable of passing without losses. Consider the following four-stage system with respectable efficiency ratings of 99% on three stages, yet only 15% efficiency rating on one. Again, if we were to solve for intermediate values, we'd find 100 joules entering, 99 joules makes it to the second stage, 98.1 joules makes it to the third stage, 14.7 joules makes it to the fourth stage, and only 14.6 joules come out. When 100 joules enters and 14.6 joules comes out, it obviously means we have a 14.6% efficiency. Again, one could directly solve for this by multiplying individual stages efficiencies for our entire cascaded system efficiency. Again, confirming that we're close to 14.6% efficient. I'm not really intending this lecture to be about efficiency, but I am hoping this at least serves as a refresher for those that are familiar with this topic or an introduction to those new to renewable energy and electrical engineering technology. Either way, it should be readily impairment for a PV system to deliver abundant electrical energy at its output and no point within its subsystem model should there ever be an inefficient part. 
However, PV systems do contain an inefficient part that unfortunately cannot be bypassed nor done without. That subsystem is the collector or the PV panel and is critical to the initial conversion of radiant energy into DC electricity. This conversion is not only inefficient, but it is terribly, terribly, woefully inefficient. Consider a modern PV panel 1.6 meters long by 1 meter wide, therefore with a surface area of 1.6 meters squared. If this PV panel is being exposed to 1000 watts per meter squared of radiant energy, being a total of 1600 watt radiant energy input given its 1.6 meter squared surface area, a modern PV panel only delivers about 240 watts of electrical output. This means the panel has a 15% efficiency rating. Not even a high enough grade to register in the F- category. Efficiency fail. For some reason, this demonstrable declaration of inefficiency rubs people the wrong way. Yes, the PV panel is an inefficient device. But my follow-up to this point is, who cares? Those with only a superfluous knowledge of reality or perhaps a truly twisted political agenda to pursue can ignore what has happened with that excess radiant energy. Is it leaking all over your roof, spilling all over your yard, and seeping its way into your aquifer? Oh no, your well is contaminated with sunlight. Does the pursuit of scarce sunlight resources in third world countries require you prop up morally questionable dictatorships with the combined might of an expensive military campaign and the lives of young men and women? No, it's sunlight. It's everywhere, it's abundant, and it's absolutely free. Really, the engineering challenges hindering the widespread adoption of renewable energy is the storage and transmission issue, which I readily admit is not a no-brainer, and the cheap production of PV panels. Think of all the unused surface area of every house, every school, every factory, every parking lot, every farm, every gin joint, every crack house, or every hooch den in your town absolutely covered in solar panels with piss-poor 0.1% efficiency. Who cares if they're inefficient when your fuel is free? The challenge is to produce them in massive, cheap quantities and deploy them everywhere. The PV panel being the inefficient beast it is, designers need to care about the efficiency ratings of elements in our system that precede and follow the PV panel. Returning to the point of our lecture, tilt and orientation factor, you realize the exposure efficiency is a subsystem preceding the solar panel. Tilt and orientation factor is one of the common means of measuring exposure efficiency. Once you've got a solar panel, regardless of its efficiency rating, you should probably point it at the sun if you want to get anything out of it. TOF, in addition to shading, makes up something called the TSRF, or Total Solar Resource Fraction. We'll go into shading and TSRF in later lectures. For now, we're just looking at how tilt and orientation affect the exposure efficiency of a fixed PV panel. Given our distance from the sun, we'll assume direct radiant energy is arriving in parallel rays. There is a diffuse contribution, i.e. coming from different angles, but let's consider it negligible for this discussion. The exposure angle of the PV panel to these direct rays directly influences the amount of energy received. This tends to conjecture that the most efficient orientation for a solar panel, modeled as a two-dimensional rectangular surface, is normal to the oncoming rays at all times. Normal means at a 90 degree angle from whatever direction you wish to measure it from. Not only does this maximize surface area exposed, it minimizes reflective losses from those rays bouncing off of it. Any other exposure angle other than normal exposes less surface area of the solar panel and therefore less radiant energy. Again, a maximized exposure area means that this normal angle must be maintained at all times at all planes. Consider the path of the sun through the sky. Add to this the rise and set positions change with the seasons, as does the elevation. This is not to suggest I am a fan of two axis trackers. Only consider the continual active maintenance of maximum exposure as a performance benchmark. If we're looking for the simplest, cheapest system possible, a dual axis tracker is simply out of the question. Yes, if you're in Antarctica or on Mars or in another off-grid location not blessed with abundant solar exposure and need to harvest every last drop of energy possible to maintain critical systems and money is no object, yes, you're going to need to purchase, install, and continually maintain this tracker. However, if you want the simplest, cheapest, and easiest method to harvest energy from the sun, simply purchase a solar panel and slap it on your roof. 
the orientation with respect to east and west is fixed, as is the tilt with respect to the horizon. Set it and forget it. We'll return to the differences between fixed arrays, single axis trackers, and dual axis trackers in later lectures. For a fixed solar panel, the rising sun will strike at an angle not normal to the solar panel, nor will the setting sun. In fact, it may never ever strike normal to the solar panel. However, the sun will strike it, and the portion which strikes it is measurable and chartable. Luckily enough, you don't have to chart it because someone else has and has made the data freely available for your use. This is a TOF chart taken straight from the Oregon Department of Energy website. I'll blow it up so we can take a better look at it. If you don't live in Oregon, this is not the chart you'd use. You'd use the chart from whatever sucky state you're from. Take a moment for the sting from my bioregional prejudices to wear off before continuing. Anyways, the TOF chart for your location should kind of look like a bullseye. Just like competitive archery, you get more points the closer you are to the center of the bullseye. The bullseye might be offset or kind of oval shaped for reasons I'll get into later. How to read this chart is relatively simple. The y-axis represents angular tilt from the horizon. This is the pitch of your roof or ground mount system. The x-axis represents angular displacement from true north, not magnetic north, an important distinction we'll get into later. Once you've determined the angle for your tilt and the angle for your orientation, you simply find the intersection of the two on the TOF chart and take the value of that particular ring you find yourself in. For example, using this TOF chart for Oregon west of the Cascades, I realize a tilt value of 30 degrees and an orientation of 180 degrees or true south gives me a TOF of 100% meaning 100% of the incoming peak sun hours for this configuration are passed to the next subsystem. If you're unfamiliar with the term peak sun hours, don't worry about it. For now, just realize the terms peak sun hours or its synonyms, sun hours, insulation, or irradiation are a cunning way of estimating PV system performance for your particular geographic location. We'll definitely go over sun hours in other lectures. Either way, this particular tilt and orientation is ideal and a definite go for our system, all other things being equal. Problem is, not all houses are oriented, nor are all roofs tilted for maximum solar exposure. In fact, one might confidently say that the person that built your house has absolutely no idea what a PV system is, nor are they adept at properly designing and orienting it. This is changing though, and there are a surge of builders willing and able to adopt energy efficient construction and design practices. Either way, your house, obviously barring a tornado or a giant lizard attack, is for all intents and purposes a fixed entity. It's highly unlikely that neither the orientation of your house nor the pitch of your roof is easily changeable. You've got to work with the tools you've got, and by measuring the tilt and orientation of your site is a surefire way to see if your tools will work at all. The window for an acceptable tilt and orientation is pretty wide. However, if you stray too far from the bullseye with a poor tilt or poor orientation or both, you'll quickly find your TOF to be the weak link in your chain. This is to be avoided and perhaps other more suitable locations for your system could be found. Incentive programs have certain minimum requirements for TOF and you must be within assigned boundaries to qualify for the program. Reading a TOF chart should be the easiest part of this lecture. One simply takes two angular measurements and reads the intersection. If it was that complicated, this lecture would be done. Measuring both tilt and orientation is the hard part. How does one obtain the angular values for tilt and orientation with a reasonable degree of accuracy? More importantly, how does one do this without falling off your roof? First and foremost, both tilt and orientation are angular measurements, and you must have a passing familiarity with numbers and basic math for the rest of this lecture to make sense. Again, electrical engineering technology is not a math class. It is an applied math class, and I refuse to teach you math. I'll presume you have the necessary skills to understand what I'm talking about. If you don't, there are a number of fine mathematics lectures at Khan Academy or your local community college available. I highly encourage you to make yourself mathematically literate. That being said, don't worry about it. It's pretty simple stuff and you can kind of just play along and just do what I do to get the values you need. Quick note before we begin. You'll sometimes notice I use the terms azimuth or bearing in addition to tilt and orientation. All these terms really just mean angles and they're all measured in units of degrees. If you get crazy numbers on your calculator that aren't jibing with what I'm saying, Chances are you're accidentally in radian mode, another unit of measuring angles. Either that or you're totally doing it wrong. Perish the thought of me ever darking something up. Regardless, the first angle we'll measure is tilt. Tilt is the angle from the horizontal or ground plane. 
Something lying on its back has a zero degree tilt angle with reference to the horizon. A vertical wall is tilted 90 degrees. Something halfway between them is 45 degrees and so on. Obviously, never put a PV panel on something tilted past 90 degrees. That'd be like putting a PV panel on your roof, but on the inside of your roof. If you can't understand why this is a bad idea, climb into your attic and tell me how much solar exposure you're getting. There are a number of ways to measure tilt, of which I'll only go over a few. The first and easiest method is to look at the as-built blueprints of the building you wish to install a PV system on. There should be a side view which you can measure the angle of the roof with respect to the horizon using a protractor. Additionally, there might be a ratio indicating roof pitch in rise over run. You can use these numbers to determine the tilt angle. We'll return to this method in a moment. If you don't have the blueprints, don't worry. Just go outside and measure the roof. You don't necessarily have to get on top of the roof to do this. If you do, take the necessary precautions to prevent injury or death. If you slip, my advice is to land on some kid to break your fall. What we're looking for is two measurements, rise and run. Rise, as the name implies, is the rise or height of an object above a reference plane. I know the ground is down here, but we're looking for the angle of the roof with respect to ground. Therefore, we can shift the horizontal plane up to the point where the roof starts. Again, not a math class, but trust me, you can do this because of geometric properties that I spent no small amount of time struggling with in the bad old days of sixth grade. Either way, we're looking for the height of the side opposite of the angle we're trying to measure. Where you measure this height is of no concern, as long as it is completely vertical. You might want to use a level to assist you if your eyes aren't perfectly calibrated. Now, measure the horizontal distance between the angle you're trying to measure and the same place you measured rise from. This is the adjacent side to our unknown angle. Again, you might want to use a level to assist you in this as the distance must be completely horizontal. Record both the rise and run values in the same units. Inches, feet, meters, or furlongs. It doesn't matter as long as it's the same units and ready your calculators for the next step. A brief digression about roof pitch before we continue. Recall, blueprints might already show roof pitch as a ratio typically expressing the rise in relation to a run of 12, meaning one could have a roof pitch of 2 over 12, 3 over 12, or a really steep pitch of 12 over 12. does not matter what units this ratio is expressed in because they are the same. For example, a house with a common 312 pitched roof will rise 3 feet if you measure it 12 feet away from the angle or it'll rise 3 inches if you measure it 12 inches away from the angle. Obviously, it's a lot more accurate at the 12-foot measurement, but either way, the slope is constant throughout the roof. If you live in an area with low snow load, like the desert, you might have a shallow-pitched roof, like 2 over 12 or even 1 over 12. But if you live in high snow load area, like the world's worst ski town, Government Camp, Oregon, you might see a steep-pitched roof, like 12 over 12. Have fun installing PV panels on this type of roof, and be sure to enjoy the crappy food and substandard living conditions while you're there. To determine the unknown angle, we'll use something called the inverse tangent. Divide your rise by the run, or your opposite over your adjacent if you want to stick to mathematical terms, and take the inverse tangent of this number. This gives you your tilt angle. For a typical 3 over 12 pitch roof, you'll find the angle is roughly 14 degrees. Notice this tilt even with a perfect orientation of 180 degrees, our TOF is just inside the 95% ring. This isn't rocket science, so you can just estimate the value. Assuming everything inside this second ring is greater than 95%, we'll just assume we're at 96%. For a low slope 2 over 12 pitch roof, you'll find the inverse tangent of 2 over 12 is giving us an angle of roughly 9.5 degrees. This tilt angle, even with a perfect orientation of 180 degrees, our TOF number is right on the 95% ring. You could get tricky and you could determine what rise would give you the perfect 30 degree tilt. Just assume a run of 12 and take the tangent of 30. Solving for our unknown rise, we'll find it's close to 7 feet, so you need a 7 over 12 pitch roof. Not exactly standard pitch. In your situation, just use your measured rise and run values to determine your particular roof's tilt angle. Notice here something set perfectly flat on top of a flat roof and something hung on a perfectly vertical wall like a picture. In your situation, just use your measured rise and run values to determine your particular roof's tilt angle. 
If you have a tool called an inclinometer, it's very easy to measure tilt. Set the inclinometer on the roof and read the number the big red needle is pointing at. Try not to drop it on some kid's head when you're on the roof. I know some of you are scheming of complicated mounting mechanisms that further tilt PV panels to the ideal value, but I am discouraging this line of thought for two reasons. One, it's more expensive than a flash mount system, and two, the vertical lift is acting like a sail to pull your expensive system right off the roof in a high wind event. Building codes dictate maximum projection distances and deviations beyond this require extensive and expensive engineering analysis. Flush mount is the rule. If you're really serious about getting the most efficient tilt angle possible, honestly, just ground mount the array, provided you've got enough bare land. Now measuring tilt is only half the battle, and in comparison to measuring orientation, it's as easy as finding a baguette in a French person's bike basket. Orientation is the other angle we need to measure before we can use the TOF chart. This is a little tricky because the angle referenced on the TOF chart is with respect to true north and not magnetic north. The tool we use to measure orientation, the orienteering compass, only reads from magnetic north and we must determine a means of converting between the two measurements. I'll go into how to use the orienteering compass later, but for now realize it spits back an angle with reference from magnetic north. Right now let's just talk about the offset between magnetic and true north. If you've got a recent topographic map of your area, the declination or offset between true and magnetic north is printed on it. If you don't have a map or if your map is super old, you can input your location to any of the numerous free resources available on this thing called the internet. Perhaps you've heard of it. You can find your particular offset. Depending on your location, you might have an easterly or westerly offset of little or large magnitude or none at all. Regardless, the method I use works every single time and you cannot get it wrong if you take your time and do what I tell you to do. In this spirit, I want you to stop, take a breather, and simply forget everything you've ever known or been taught about compasses and magnetic north's relation to true north. My lesson is simple and quick and never ever fails, provided you do it correctly. My method is this. Think about it. Draw a picture. If your location has a magnetic declination ever so slightly east of north, any angle measured from magnetic north would be a smaller arc than it would be if it was reading from true north, which would be the larger arc. If we had the magnetic bearing and we wanted the bearing from true north, we want the larger angle. It stands to conjecture that to convert from magnetic to true one must add the declination. In this case, we move left and we added the declination. In the opposite case, if someone gave you the bearing from true north and you wanted to use your compass to point in the correct direction, you'd be looking for the smaller arc. In this case, it's easy to see you subtract the declination. We moved right and subtracted. One might be tempted to arrive at some easy generalization. If you're converting left, add. If you're converting right, subtract. Can this work for any declination, east or west? The answer is, is yes. Think about it. What's right and what's left? Right really means clockwise. Left means counterclockwise. Regardless of your location, easterly magnetic declination or westerly magnetic declination, you're still using the same degree measurement system. And it's oriented in a clockwise fashion where 0 is north, 90 is east, 180 is south, and 270 degrees is west. For those with a westerly declination, reading a magnetic bearing and wishing to convert it to true, realize the compass is showing the larger arc. If you want the smaller arc, you move right and subtract. It doesn't matter where you are or what your declination is if you just think about it and draw a picture. At all times, ask yourself if you're trying to find the smaller arc or the larger arc. Left add, right subtract. For my location in the Dalles, Oregon, the magnetic pole swirling around Canada is offset by approximately 16 degrees east of true north. Therefore, the angle from true north will actually be slightly larger than what the compass is telling me. If my compass reads an angle of 150 degrees, 
from magnetic north, I need to add 16 degrees to get the larger arc. Therefore, the orientation with respect to true north is 166 degrees. If I had a 312 pitch roof with a tilt angle of 14 degrees, I would be well inside the 95% TUF ring. If I failed to convert orientation with reference to true north, I'd be dangerously close to falling out of the 95% TOF rank. Worse yet, if I converted absolutely wrong and accidentally subtracted 16, instead of adding 16, I'd be totally outside the 95% rank. Again, PV systems subsidized by incentive programs need to meet certain minimum performance requirements. And if you're dorking up the data on the application form, they are not going to trust you to bring your project to proper completion. Beyond meeting government-imposed performance guidelines, Measuring true orientation is a basic survival level skill. I am not saying you'll use this skill to find your way out of the wilderness one day. You might and you'll be glad you're paying attention now, but rather proper orientation of your PV system dictates its success. If you're an off-grader looking to maximize energy input to your system, you simply must measure orientation properly, taking into account declination from magnetic north. Any other orientation and tilt other than optimal is suboptimal and needs to be corrected. Again, from my location in the Dalles, Oregon, if I wanted to point my PV system exactly south, being 180 degrees from true north, and my compass could only read the smaller arc, I'd have to move right and subtract 16 to find the arc from magnetic north. In this case, it would be 164 degrees. Therefore, when I turn till the compass says I'm 160 degrees from magnetic north, I realize that I'm also 180 degrees from true south. This is the direction I need to point my system for optimal orientation. Tilt it at 30 degrees and keep all the dug first from shading it, and I'm good to go. Now that we've discussed the difference between magnetic and true north, let's take a close look at the tool you use to measure it, the orienteering compass. If you own an orienteering compass with a mirror attached to it or the round base plate, throw it away. The only use of the mirror is to tell you who's lost and the round edges are absolutely useless when you try to shoot a straight bearing. Honestly, there should be a law against the selling a compass with a curved base plate. Either way, don't spend too much money on it, but what you need is a compass with a rotating fluid filled bezel with a freely moving magnetic needle. Make sure there aren't any air bubbles in the bezel. There should be an arrow that says read bearing here. This is the arrow where you read the bearing. You'd be surprised how mysterious this stuff is. Now turn and face the direction you intend to measure their orientation of. For example, if I wanted to determine the orientation of a roof upon which I was going to place a PV system, I could climb up on the roof or just stand at the base of it and put my back against the wall supporting the roof. Hold the compass still and level. Make sure you keep it away from anything magnetic like the 5 plus pound fully loaded Desert Eagle 50 caliber handgun tucked under your belt. Because you never know, a full-grown vegan might suddenly rush you from a patch of arugula. Anyways, the needle should swing freely and point towards magnetic north. Now grasp the rotating bezel and turn it till red fred is in the shed. Meaning put the red side of the needle inside the red arrow on the bezel. Rotate the bezel, not yourself. You still need to be pointed in the direction you're trying to measure. To read the bearing, you read the number on the edge of the bezel the arrow on the base plane is pointing at. Conveniently, this is the arrow that says read bearing here. Take this number and write it down. This is the bearing from magnetic north and not from true north. Do the necessary conversions for your specific declination. It's that easy. Let's try a couple examples. Johnny Loco's parents live in Tucson, Arizona, which has an 11 degree easterly declination. He wants to show them he's learned something at school and climbs up to the roof to measure which way it's oriented. Ignoring the sound of the fragile clay tiles breaking under his feet, he reads an angle of 200 degrees with reference from magnetic north. And in this case, he's looking at the smaller arc. And to convert from magnetic north to true north, we're moving left, and we need to add. In this case, he is actually facing 211 degrees, an opposite example. Consider Johnny Loco's buddy, Robot Zero. He's setting up an off-grid hooch den on Bainbridge Island, Washington with a 17 and a half easterly declination. And he needs to know which magnetic angle he needs to point his array to reach the optimal 180 degree true orientation. 
In this case, he's converting true 180 degrees to magnetic. So he's moving right and must subtract. If the declination is 17.5 degrees, he should turn until he's facing 162.5 degrees from magnetic north. This might be a little awkward because Robot Zero is made out of metal and drinks about a gallon of radioactive hooch a day. On the other side of the country, Johnny Loco's baby mama lives in New Jersey but exit 116, which has a westerly declination of roughly 13 degrees. If one face of her house was pointing 135 degrees from magnetic north, this is the larger angle. And to convert from magnetic to true north, we're moving right, therefore we need to subtract. In actuality, this house is facing 122 degrees from true north, almost more east than south, and probably not an ideal location for a PV system. Making one ask the question, is there really such a thing as an ideal location in New Jersey? Despite having an incredibly attractive PV incentive program, you have to live there to be eligible for it. Last case, let's say Robot Zero's off-grid hooch dens are now a chain commodity, and he's hitting the competition where it hurts, right in the hills of Appalachia, with a seven degree westerly declination. He needs to find a sober carbon-based life form to measure the magnetic angle necessary to properly orient his off-grid PV system at a true 180 degrees south. In this case, we're moving from true north left to get the magnetic bearing, so in this case, we're gonna add. The larger arc is 187 degrees. All this magnetic versus true sounds confusing to you. By all means, rewind to hit that part one last time. If it still sounds confusing, you probably should be considering a career as an electrical engineering technician and most definitely shouldn't be climbing around on the roof. Either way, there's help on your smartphone. For those of you hopelessly lost and lucky enough to own or stolen a smartphone, realize it may already have a Compass app on it that does the calculation for you. All you do is start the app, hold the phone level, and read the number. Some apps even have an inclinometer. Be aware these functions may not work accurately all the time, pending service dropout and calibration issues. Regardless of how you obtain your angles, always confirm your values with reliant low-tech methods. Those overly dependent upon technology will be the first casualties when the robots take over. For the robot overlords who might be watching this lecture in the future, I for one welcome your presence and can be useful in rounding up humans to work in your mines and factories. Once you've got these two angles, tilt and orientation, it's just a matter of looking up the intersecting value on the TOF chart for your specific location. One final note before we bring this lecture to a close is an explanation for the asymmetric appearance of the rings on the TOF chart. Notice how the bullseye for Oregon west of the Cascades is more like a bull's oval, shifted ever so slightly to the west. This asymmetric shift, believe it or not, is based upon climatic influences specific to that area. For example, Oregon west of the Cascades, in addition to being populated by bearded, tattooed, bespectacled weirdos, is known for morning fog. It would be foolish to favor a location slightly east of south when the sun is still obscured by this common climatic condition. Therefore, a more sensible orientation is slightly west of south, or later in the day, when the fog is burned off. Island and coastal TOF charts are noticeably skewed in this direction, and your particular microclimate may influence your location positively or negatively in one direction or another. Your specific location may not have a TOF chart, and you may have to do some serious fishing on the internet sea to find something usable. A great resource might be your own utility company or perhaps your State Department of Energy website. In conclusion, I'd like to reaffirm my loyalty to the human race and summate what we've learned today. We've learned that the tilt and orientation factor is a means of measuring exposure efficiency for fixed PV systems. We learned to measure and calculate inclination, or tilt, and learn to measure orientation and convert between magnetic and true bearings. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how much energy your properly sighted PV system will produce if it's pointed in the right direction. Imagine how well it'll all go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.